A recent study from UCLA found that in the 2009-2010 school year, over two million middle and high school students were suspended for discipline or truancy issues. Two million. And I put that into context. Two million translates into an, an average classroom, three students in every single secondary class in our country removed from school. For subpopulations of students that are disproportionately affected by these suspensions, minority students, English language learners, students with disabilities, the numbers are even more staggering. For example, for black male students with a disability, they face a 36% chance of being suspended. In the same average class, that's over a third. If the number still isn't striking enough to you, bear in mind that additional research has found that a single ninth grade suspension will double the chances that any of these students in red will drop out of high school completely. This is a problem. I believe there are solutions to this problem, but in order to arrive at them, we need to be able to untangle some of the complexities involved. And I believe there are two factors that we can examine that will help us understand what contributes to these scary statistics. Now, the first factor has to do with zero tolerance policies which have proliferated our nation's schools over the last 20 years. Uh, zero tolerance is a discipline management paradigm that emphasizes strict uniform punishments for both severe behaviors like bringing drugs to school, but also for minor behaviors like yelling out in class. Now, coincidentally, Along with this 20-year history of zero tolerance is a two-decade-long surge in the research on the neuroscience of adolescent cognitive behavioral development. And the reason this is important is because suspensions increase five times at the start of middle school, which is the hallmark beginning of that awesomely awkward period <laughs> called adolescence. I know a little bit about adolescence. This was me as an eighth grade science teacher in Houston. So I've worked with teens and believe me, I, I get it. <laughs> I understand the frustration that you can feel trying to engage all these kids at this wonderful lesson, only to have it completely fall apart because of some crazy disruption from the back of the class, thinking about all the great academic heights you could reach with all of these students. If only you could get rid of these students. <laughs> but this mindset will not do, because public schools have an obligation to teach all learners. I've spent the last two years here at Teachers College studying neuroscience and education. And what I would like to do with you today is juxtapose three key components of zero tolerance discipline, which have failed our schools with three known, well-researched principles of adolescent brain development that I believe can be used to leverage and repair these broken systems. In essence, it's a conversation about how by understanding changes in the teenage brain, we can make more positive changes in our nation's schools. So the first component of zero tolerance is this exclusionary mindset, removing the student from the school as a form of punishment. But Anytime you take kids out of school, you lose the ability to harness one of the most basic tenets of adolescent development. That's that the adolescent brain is primed for learning. Not just academic learning, but social learning, emotional learning, the development of morals and ethics. And we all want teenagers to have lots of those. <laughs> and to see why this is the case, we looked at two processes in the brain called pruning and plasticity. Now pruning is a phenomenon where neurons in the brain that are not widely used are eliminated. And the survivors are strengthened and reinforced. And this generally makes the brain more efficient. Somewhat related to this is the concept of plasticity, which refers to the brain's ability to change connections amongst neurons and across brain regions in responses to changes in the environment. 
To see this at work, we can look at the amazing Technicolor teenage brain here. Specifically, I want to draw your attention to this region called the prefrontal cortex, which I've circled for you. Now, the prefrontal cortex is like the most important region of the brain that you need to be successful in school. Reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, all of the critical thinking skills that you need, problem solving, making and achieving long-term goals, and even regulating your emotions are all in the domain of the prefrontal cortex, the PFC. Now, in this image of the prefrontal cortex in early adolescence, you see lots of yellows and greens. Now, these colors represent a higher density of neurons. That's because early adolescence is marked by a big surge and an increase in the number of neurons in the brain. So that means not a lot of pruning has happened here yet. And when there's not a lot of pruning, you have a very highly plastic, malleable brain. This balance shifts somewhat by age of 16, a little bit more by the age of 18 where you begin to see the encroachment of these blues and purples, colors which represent areas of lower neuron density because more pruning has taken place, making these regions less plastic, more fixed. This continues on into early adulthood at age 21, but the prefrontal cortex continues to develop until your mid-20s, around the age of 25. And that means that the cognitive processes supported by the PFC are still immature as well. Now for schools, what is the thing that determines which neurons are pruned, which connections are made, how effective those connections are at doing their job? It's your experiences, your interactions with your environment. It's also critical to remember that this period of early to late adolescence is the last time in your life that your brain will be this highly plastic. And when you think about how students spend eight hours a day, five days a week, 180 days a year in a school, I'd say that makes them pretty important environments to support brain development. And we know that suspensions are harmful for students, we know this. So we need to adapt a mindset of using rule violations as opportunities for learning the soft skills that you need to be successful. And you need to teach these skills at a time when the brain is most susceptible and most sensitive to receive and learn them. The second component of zero tolerance that we need to re-examine is this issuance of uniform, predetermined punishments that don't really take in individual context and consideration. The reason this is developmentally inappropriate is because in the realm of the adolescent brain, emotional context is everything. <clears throat> the teenage brain is highly sensitive to emotional stimuli. And there are few environments more ripe with emotional stimuli than a middle school hallway. Now, the reason for this emotional sensitivity has a lot to do with this structure here called the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is an emotional generator, specifically emotions like fear, anger, anxiety, and aggression. As a general rule, the amygdala in adolescence responds more intensely to emotional stimuli than it does in adulthood, which is why if you've ever seen a 14-year-old like completely explode over something that happened on Facebook, you can blame this structure here. The reason it does that has to do with another concept called functional connectivity. That's pretty much what it sounds like. It's the relationship between a generator in the brain, in this case the amygdala as an emotional generator, and another structure in the brain which regulates it. Well, in the adolescent brain, the thing that regulates the amygdala is still not completely developed yet. You already know what it is. It's the prefrontal cortex, and it doesn't get developed in fully until the age of 25. And so you have this one structure turning the volume all the way up on emotions, and another structure that's not really that great at quieting those emotions back down. Functional connectivity 
has significant implications for his child's performance at school. As a quick example, weak functional connectivity has been linked to adolescent depression and anxiety. Now, these two conditions account for at least a fifth of all adolescents. And they're also linked to lower academic performance and greater instances of behavioral problems in school, which suggests that there is a significant subpopulation of students coming to school hardwired to have difficulty regulating their emotions and navigating a highly emotional environment. The way this pans out is a common situation that I experienced as a teacher. A student leaves my classroom and they're like really, really pissed because they failed a quiz that I gave last period. And another student leaves their classroom and they're really pissed off because maybe they got into an argument with their mom that morning and they run into each other in the hall and we call that an emotionally hot context because now you have a middle school hallway fight. Their amygdalas are raging and they do not have the connectivity to kind of quiet those things down. Those connections will form on their own a little, but to really get effective, efficient, strong functional connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and amygdala requires training and practice over the course of your development. A zero tolerance would say both of these kids get suspended, maybe even removed to an alternative facility for part of the school year. But if we do that, we don't intervene. We don't teach them the skills they need. We don't give them the practice necessary to ever react differently in that same situation later. So if we can adapt a mindset of guiding students through these emotionally hot contexts, supporting them, teaching them the conflict management skills that they need to be successful, we can actually change structures in the brain to set them up for success now and throughout adulthood. The third component and the final part of zero tolerance we're going to talk about today is this idea of separating all the bad kids from all the good kids so they don't spread their misbehavior like a disease. We need to quarantine them is really what we're trying to do. When you practice peer isolation, you also lose the ability to leverage the third and I think one of the most interesting components of the teenage brain, which is that the adolescent brain is highly sensitive to social influences. There's a great study that illustrates this point. What these researchers looked at was peer influence on risk-taking in decision-making. They took uh, adolescents and compared them to young adults and to adults over the age of 35. And they put them in an fMRI and had them play sort of a virtual driving game. And the goal of the game is to get this little car to the other end of a road as quickly as you can. But along the way, there are stoplights. And the lights will turn from green to yellow. And there's your risky decision. Now what do you do? do you, are you going to gun it and risk getting slammed in the side by another car? Or do you safely and maturely slow down like a good driver should? Well, if you look at the blue bars, which represent all of these groups when they do this task alone, we all make comparable numbers of risky decisions. Teenagers aren't always doing the wrong thing. Oftentimes, they will also think like adults. But in the presence of a peer, the red bars, in adolescence only, you see a significant increase in risky decision-making. Six times out of 10, they're gonna gun it through that light and try to beat the car that's barreling at them. Now this may suggest, well, clearly isolating them from one another is a great idea because when you get teenagers together, they do terrible things and crash cars. But drawing that conclusion misses the bigger picture because there's something very interesting at work that explains why this happens. In the adolescent group, only in the presence of a peer, but regardless of which decision they made, we see an activation of two key brain regions, the orbitofrontal cortex 
and the ventral striatum. Now taken together, these two structures are part of a larger reward system. And here what they're doing is attaching an emotional significance, a feeling of great importance to a particular stimuli. Now we know the stimuli isn't the light because it would have shown up in all of the other groups too, or at least it would have shown up in the adolescent alone group. The stimuli was the peer. And this gives us a beautiful glimpse into the world of the teenage social mind. Only in adolescence will the presence of your friends activate a unique social emotional reward circuitry. Now this can be leveraged and it can be used for evil, but it can also be used for good. And now as educators, we have a choice. Do we take that chronically disruptive student and send him home where his social influence is gonna be everyone else who's not at school either? Or do we keep that student in school where we can facilitate peer-based positive behavior support systems to guide healthier decision-making? Now this is harder to do than suspensions and it takes more work and it takes more time, but it is possible and the outcomes are significantly, significantly better. I am passionate about neuroscience, but my, my motivation for speaking to you today comes from my time as a teacher. And I've got a lot of great success stories that'd be really easy to stand up here and share with you, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm going to tell you the story of a student I was unable to help. He was a very bright young man in my first period eighth grade science class. He's a 16 year old immigrant from Somalia and he didn't have the strongest educational background, so he struggled academically. And school was not an environment where he felt confident or comfortable or supported. So he was defiant and he was truant and he was often combative with not just other students, but with teachers as well. We suspended him. And we suspended him a few times. And uh, we then transferred him later on in the school year to an alternative facility. And I pretty much lost track of him after that. I had no idea what happened. That really bothered me for a long time. Recently, um, actually last weekend, I found out what did happen to him. Two years after we removed him to an alternative school, he was 18 years old and he was arrested for robbing someone at gunpoint. And now he is a criminal. But before that happened, we had him. We had him in a system that could have supported him, guided him, and helped him cope in healthy ways with a very hard and stressful life. But that instead had structures in place designed to exclude him. And that's the problem with zero tolerance. It loads the proverbial dice against students that are most at risk. There are no easy solutions to this problem, but an important step in the right direction is to teach educators about the biological reasons for why teenagers are the way they are and to teach them about the biobehavioral ecosystem of support structures that exist and can be implemented in schools with existing resources to give kids that support. Policymakers also need to understand that for a lot of kids in this country, schools may be their only access point to this support. If we can do these three things, and start walking down a different path away from zero tolerance and towards a more developmentally appropriate and aligned system of behavior management, I believe we can genuinely transform all schools into environments that will support all of our nation's developing brains. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>